Sean with ABC News. A coal ship has run aground on a Newcastle beach as the New South Wales coast is lashed by heavy winds and rain causing huge swells. Rescue helicopters are on standby off the coast of Newcastle in New South Wales to evacuate people from a freighter that's run aground near Nobby's Head at the mouth of the Hunter River. The coal ship is believed to have dragged its anchor chain after being buffeted by high winds and big seas overnight. This is amazing as another massive wave crashes over the deck. It can only be 20 metres directly above the deck. You speak to me, I've just had two of the crew members walk past me. They're a Filipino crew. Everybody is well and fine. I got a quick word with one of the crew earlier and they said it's OK, just scary, was the one oh. that he said. Quite a large, uh, looks like a coal uh, ship that's uh, running around on Nobby's Beach. And the weather is absolutely foul and the city conditions are uh, atrocious. This Switzer Salvage story takes us to New South Wales in Australia and Australia's largest coal port in the coastal town of Newcastle. Daily, ships move in and out of two coal terminals here to pick up cargo. All these many arriving coal carriers have to come down the Hunter River and pass Nobby's Beach. On an average day, perhaps 50 ships are waiting in the offshore anchorage between 2 and 5 kilometres from the coast. The morning weather report of the 8th of June 2007 left no room for misunderstanding. Two low pressure systems were centered on Newcastle and the central coast, bringing cyclonic winds, torrential rain and massive seas peaking at 18 meters. Heavy storms would hit the coast at Newcastle. 56 ships were radioed by the Newcastle Port Corporation to move out to sea to safer waters. But as the storm hit, the Pasha Bulka could not clear the coast and just on 9.15 in the morning was beached. As the storm passed, it became clear that the Pasha Bulka, a Panamax bulk carrier of 76,500 metric tons, was hard aground on Nobby's beach. After negotiations with insurers and the ship's Japanese owners, Switzer Salvage Australasia, based in Sydney, won the salvage contract. When an event like this occurs on a popular and pristine beach where people love to surf, it is clear there will be a lot of media attention. But Switzer Salvage had handled these psychologically sensitive situations before. Okay, first of all, I'd like to introduce and welcome Drew Shannon. He's the Zwitsa Salvage Master. At the moment, there are 16 members of the salvage team on board the ship, and uh, they're currently continuing the assessment that's going on. They're working with five crew members and one person from AMSA. As you would all appreciate, this is a difficult and dangerous job. There are no simple solutions. We would love to say this, this operation will be a great success, and give clear timelines, but I simply can't. What I can say is that we are making good progress with our salvage plan. Before Switzer Salvage signs a contract, the salvage master and a skeleton team first assess the condition of the casualty. Salvage investigations on the 11th of June confirmed that the outer shell of the ship's double hull had been breached and the vessel was taking water on the starboard side. It was decided that a refloating attempt would proceed despite concerns that the ship could be badly damaged. Any attempt at moving the ship would be made at high tide at the end of the month. The salvage attempt would not involve removing any of the fuel or lube oil. Tugboats are prepared and the crew briefed for the refloating attempt. You come in, hand Dave the shackle or the sling. His job is to put that back on. You just walk away with me. We just get out the way. Everyone heads to the cage to make sure it floats out nice and clear. I've got to try and keep a good view of what's happening in the cage. We need to nominate a person now that's happy to stand on the after end of the strong back in case it gets fouled. Because of the swell, the tugs cannot approach the casualty and the towing gear has to be transferred by helicopter.
the Minister for Ports and Waterways, Joe Tripodi himself, and other officials take a look at the situation. The plan to salvage the Pasha Balka first involves flooding some cargo holds to hold her stably in place on the bottom to prevent further movement while the tugs prepare and get in place. Then the fuel oil will be pumped to tanks located away from the damaged hull. Ground tackle anchors are positioned on the seabed and connected to the reinstated ship's winch. By attaching blocks with five sheaves, the force of a single 10-ton winch can be multiplied to as much as 100 tons, thus giving enough force to help the tugs free the casualty. Pumps are prepared to empty the flooded cargo holds to allow the refloat operation to start. A final check is made of all connections of the tackle system. 14 days now of calculations by our naval architect to assess the condition of the ship. We've got a hydrographic survey that's been ongoing since the first weekend that this occurred. We've got a very good understanding now of the seabed in the surrounding area. We do have two, two legs of ground tackle out forward and one out aft to, to stop the stern of the ship going further onto the beach. I'm quietly confident that we're going to get the ship off. A hydrographic survey of the exit path is made and the salvage team prepares for the refloat. Guys, I just do, I just do a brief introduction to you. We have Minister Tripodi. We also have crew. crew come through. Crews from Spitzer, Salvage, and also obviously Gary who you met before. When a big ship like this comes to shore and the salvage team is called in, it takes time to get to know the vessel. You have to come to terms with the ship's design and structure, the damage sustained and how best to stabilise the vessel. You have to take in an extraordinary number of factors into account so that you can move towards the best chance of refloating this ship. As we progress, we must remain open-minded that we are dealing with many dynamics. Things can change, and those are things we can't predict. An emergency response team of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, AMSA, has been instructed to remain on standby should the vessel begin leaking fuel. An exclusion zone is set up round the ship with marker buoys to keep surfers and the curious at a healthy distance. The status at the moment is we have proceeded with connecting the two tugs, Kira and Wuna, yesterday. It's Wednesday the 27th. This morning we've connected the Pacific Responder, the anchor handling vessel that we've also chartered. We now have three tugs connected to the casualty. We have a fourth tug, the Wickham, which is on standby mode around the casualty now. As we speak, the salvage team is commencing to de-ballast number four cargo hold. And later this morning we'll commence just blowing down the double bottom tanks. The high tide is due at 18.51 this evening. At that time, we'll make an attempt to swing the, the ship's bow off to port to seaward. And when we get to that stage, we'll then reassess whether or not we can refloat the ship tonight on the same tide, or whether or not we'll have to wait until tomorrow's high tide to complete it. Final preparations to refloat the vessel begin thus by emptying cargo holds and raising buoyancy. At around 5.30 in the afternoon, the tugs start pulling on the lines attached to the bow on the port side and the ship appears to move slightly. A four metre ocean swell pounds the ship and causes the bow to move back and forth. Now we have a minimal water level in the forepeak and I've just started number three to bring it back down to its minimal level, over. Thank you. More force is applied, but one of the cables connected to the tug Kira snaps and the refloat has to be aborted. New cables are immediately ordered to the dock from the local Switzer equipment stockpile and spooled on the winch on the tug Kira. A 
Dyneema cable, known for its extreme strength, is flown in from Singapore. When the tug is back in position, again with the help of the helicopter, the tow wire is brought to the ship where the salvers will reinstate the connection. Helicopter pilots in this work know their job well and can handle the most delicate of situations. The ship is under stress, so time is of the essence. We acknowledge that a refloat attempt late in the month is probably our best chance, but again, I stress to you all that it is not a given that an attempt will be made. If an attempt is made at this time, if it is not made at this time, it doesn't mean that our efforts have failed. This is work in progress. The salvage personnel working on this operation are amongst the best in the world. They are professionals committed to a successful outcome. Late afternoon on the 1st of July at the start of high tide, the salvage master gives the order to start pulling to all three tugs. Slowly, the Pasha Balka starts to move. She is almost ready to clear the reef. The three tugs successfully rotate the vessel 30 degrees and she is now facing the open sea. The following morning at dawn, it becomes clear what happened the night before. At low tide, it is clearly visible that the propeller is badly damaged. Notwithstanding the concerns of the media, the vessel has been successfully shifted thanks to the effort of the salvage team. The casualty has been turned 36 degrees and is now facing deep water. Held safely in place by three tugs and ready for the refloat. Gale force winds are again forecast for the coastal areas around Newcastle, but authorities remain optimistic that the operation will proceed as planned. Evening of the 2nd of July, the salvage master increases the power of the three tugs to 100%. We're in a standby, the casualty is coming afloat. Order up around, have a let go. Yes, sir. Make sure everyone's clear and cut the sides. Fire is gone as well. What fire is gone is clear, good. At precisely 9.37 in the evening, the Pasha Bulka pulls free from the reef and a few minutes later is 500 meters offshore. It's my pleasure to once again introduce uh, Drew Shannon, the salvage master from uh, Switzer Salvage. And I just want to say before I hand over to Drew, on behalf of the New South Wales government and the people of New South Wales, in particular the people of Newcastle, I want to thank uh, Drew and his whole team, along with Newcastle Port Corporation and all the other public servants from New South Wales and around the, the eastern seaboard states for the great job that they've done in delivering back the beautiful coastline of this state. An immediate inspection of the beach proves there has been no oil spill. The Pasha Bulka is kept afloat 10 miles from the Newcastle shoreline for inspection. After a trying three and a half weeks, I'm happy on behalf of the entire Spitzer salvage team to say that the refloating of the Pasha Bulka has been successful. We can understand that some people might have liked a quicker result, but most people knew that this was a challenging operation. The decision to execute a flexible plan with safety as the, was the number one priority to lead us to a successful outcome. We were asked to do a difficult job and we did it to the very best of our ability. We executed the best possible plan and delivered the best possible outcome. 
timing was always of the essence. The Pasha Balka is currently 10 nautical miles offshore for the next phase of our plan. The ship's outer hull is to be inspected over the next two days. Please be assured that we will be exercising our best endeavours to safely bring her into port. Once she was afloat, we towed her out to sea and on the following day, which was yesterday, we carried out an underwater inspection of the hull, which was the first opportunity we had to actually inspect the damage. Following that, we gained approval from the Port Authority to bring the ship into port so that a more detailed and thorough assessment of the underwater hull could be carried out and further temporary repairs could be made. Today, we've actually towed the ship in with the assistance of six tugs in total. We've retrieved all our ground tackle and anchors and now that we're alongside, we will look to carry out those temporary repairs and also do the detailed inspection and then re-deliver the ship. This has been a very good job in the sense that we've brought in people from three different countries. We've all come in and worked together as though that they had been together for many years. We've been able to call in on additional equipment from overseas, which was needed. Uh, the support from Shoreside, both here in Australia, Singapore and in Holland has been fantastic. And all in all, it has been a team effort. After recovery, the Pasha Balka is prepared for the tow back for repairs in Japan. In May 2008, she receives a new name, the Drake, a new funnel, a new coat of paint, and some more tough tasks out on the water. Finally, Switzer Salvage is an organisation that does not seek a high profile or accolades and applause. We do what we do and we move on. <laughs>